Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, and today we're joined by the studio heads and co-founders of Sledgehammer Games from Call of Duty fame. Uh, it is Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry. And what we're going to do is to wrap up our month of coverage to go with the September cover story in Game Informer is we got dozens and dozens of questions from the community about the beta, about the campaign, uh, historical accuracy, uh, talking about the war in general and the game specifically with some techie deep dive questions. And so we're going to volley those questions from the community to Michael and Glenn. So we hope you learned something. So without further ado, here's Michael and Glenn. Michael and Glenn, welcome to the Game Informer Show, guys. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. You guys have been traveling a lot lately. Are you back in the office now? I think we, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have been traveling a lot. And uh, this morning we're in our Foley room making some noise. And uh, we thought we'd reach out and talk to you Say and hello. answer some questions. Beautiful. So you guys were just at Gamescom. Uh, what was that experience like showing the showing the game in Germany? Oh, it's always great going to Germany and, and having the fans come and play the game and being able to talk with them and kind of mingle and find out stuff. Plus, it's it's always good to get out after three years working on a project. <laughs> but uh, this particular Gamescom, I'd say, was... Uh, uh, just really, really positive for the game. Uh, the the beta went great, and uh, you know everybody was playing. And man, it was it was really good. Yeah. Is there any one piece of feedback that really stood out to you? Something that had the biggest impact? You know, it, for us, I think like Glenn mentioned, nearly three years making the game, and you finally have a chance to get in the hands of fans, both at Gamescom Live, right, and in the beta worldwide. And so, tons of great feedback we've gotten from the community. Um, Great More sentiment. Than anything. You know, yeah. the sentiment's nice to hear, that's for sure. I think that's the one big takeaway is the team, you know, you have the you get so close to a game, you get your, your nose pressed up against the canvas of the, the this piece of art you've been making. Um, and sometimes you can lose sight of it. And when the fans validate the decisions you're making, that feels really great. And so we're thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Well, diving into questions from the community here. The first one is from a mysterious uh, M. Condry saying, I'd like to ask Glenn, what's happening in this photo? And the photos of you, Glenn, just kind of Asleep in a chair? What's going on here? Asleep. Or somebody focusing really up, hard. Somebody has to come up with the ideas here. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we show fans that photo? Do you have okay. that photo? Yep, flashing on yeah, the screen. Let's, let's, All right. We can ask fans. Maybe we can we can You're recreate. about to start. Uh, we, we, I think a, a new meme. I think we should start a new meme right here on the Game Informer Show. Ooh, right. if this is where we're going this early in the podcast, you're in trouble. <laughs> After years of working with each other. We have to come up with the ideas here, so... <laughs> I lay back and it hits me. Uh, then you shout up, Eureka, World War II, I've got it. I was like, fire country. <laughs> Do you guys still surprise each other after all these years working together? Do you? Is it just a marriage where you fully know each other inside and out at this point? Uh, if you know anything about Glenn Schofield, nothing is normal. <laughs> Surprises, yes, there are plenty. Yep, and your fashion sense surprises me every day as well. <laughs> I walked in, I walked, I came back from a conference. Um, I went to use the restroom. I come back and there's a starfish sitting in my desk, like a live starfish. Because <laughs> in the moment that I went out to use the restroom, Glenn decided to run out of the beach and take a starfish from the ocean and put it where my chair was. Allegedly. So in the world of surprises, uh, this is not a normal marriage. <laughs> All right. First real question here. Uh, guys been playing the beta. Trench Mace says he's a huge fan of Call of Duty in general, as well as history and firearms. Uh, Call of Duty World War II is a wonderful combination to me. How do you guys balance historical accuracy and fun, specifically in multiplayer? He's noticing like, oh, some weapons like the MG42 fire a little bit slowly, more slowly in game than real life counterpoints. Uh, how much do you guys balance that just historical accuracy for multiplayer? You know, it's something we've wrestled with the whole project, right? I mean, it is a piece of entertainment. It needs to be fun. It needs to be Call of Duty. Um, and at the same time, it needs to honor what was the world's greatest conflict, right? This atrocity in, in human history where a lot of um, bad things happen to good people, if you will. So, you know, we, we went to museums. We got on the ground across the globe. We, we went to firing ranges where we actually fired these weapons. So we've tried to capture the spirit of this really brutal and gritty war. Um, but in certain areas, yeah, we've had to make some creative liberties to make it feel like Call of Duty. Now, the weapons are, are really close, like the actual model. We scan the weapons. We record the weapons actually firing. We've had them when Garan on the, on the firing range. That has been great. Um, we went to, you know, every map that you saw, you've seen in the beta. We went to the Arden Forest. We went to Aachen. We went to Gibraltar. We went to Normandy. So we've tried to capture that spirit. Um, 
So authenticity is important to us. And imagine yes. oh, this. Just the sounds of the weapons. Um, you know, we'll go and and if you listen to them right now, we'll also beef them up a little bit, you know, to make it sound uh, a little bit better. And um, and so fun when you talked about fun versus the the um, sort of realistic everything they're wearing, everything they're, 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 um, they're in their environments are based on as much realism and accuracy as if we can, we can get, uh, we also know that we have to make it fun. So we want to make sure that the, the guns sound right and look right. And the firing rate is, is good compared to each weapon. Yeah. I'd imagine there's a weird balancing act to kind of push and pull between, I imagine designers on the team are pushing it one way, maybe your historical consultants are trying to push it another way. And does it kind of differ amongst designers where some want to be literal and strict with multiplayer weapons and others kind of want to push it for like, we got to look, it's got to be fun. We got to push it in that direction whenever we can. Yeah. And we start from a place of authenticity, right? So we, I think everybody on the team is committed to that. So we begin from a place of trying to capture the, the real weapon and the spirit of the real weapon. But of course, you know, uh, Call of Duty has always had the ability to fire a 50 caliber sniper rifle from ADS, right? Like that's not really, you know, I've, we picked up some sniper rifles, right? You don't run around, um, you know, yeah. shooting from the hip with these things, right? And so it is that tough balance, but the team starts from the place of the real weapon. Um, and then, you know, with minor adjustments to balance for gameplay, trying to, I think, reach where we were with the, with yeah. the beta. You know, and the funny thing is with, with accuracy and, and, um, Reading all the stories, you'll find, you know, even going through, let's say, the the uh, the story of uh, Cobra, um, which is a, a big war, uh, they'll have anywhere where one person will say there were 200 bombers flying, and, and the next one will be there was 450 bombers flying in there. The records aren't quite as good in some places, so mm. we have to patch them all together, and so we, we think we're about as accurate as we can get, but we know that some of it is just based on memory. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, Commando Forty Eight's wondering if everything within the game and multiplayer specifically will be set based on real world events. Is there any sort of alternate timeline, maps, or anything you guys are thinking about? Or are you trying to be strict throughout this entire game's life? Commando Forty Eight, that's a great question. So uh, we're focused on the European theory of war, and we want to deliver the fantasy of fighting Axis versus Allied in really iconic locations. Um, I think. Gibraltar is a fantastic map, and, and fans are loving it in the beta. The feedback we're getting, um, it's a very popular map. There were no Axis ally uh, ground conflicts in Gibraltar, for example, right? So, yes, it's it's not fantastical. It's not alternate universe, um, but we want to place you on the ground in some of these places where maybe, you know, infantrymen from both divisions um, didn't actually have conflict. There's a couple other maps like that that are really iconic and really special, and we think fans are going to love. Um, some that we haven't announced yet. Um, in the trailer, you saw the reveal trailer. Um, one of my favorite maps is called the USS Texas. It's a big battleship. Um, it's a sort of a non-traditional layout. It's a little longer, multi-level. Um, again, great map. A lot of fun. Um, I don't think there was ever Germans and Americans fighting each other on the USS Texas. And that's example. as far-fetched you guys are planning on getting with proper multiplayer, though? Well, even you know, let's if you go into the campaign, right? Uh, you'll have a level that's based on a you know Battle of the Bulge or something like that, and uh, you know that that took weeks. But we're we're playing it. We we need to condense it down to you know whatever size the level is, and and so you're taking liberties, of course. But you, we're trying to take in the best moments, you know. So everything is based on real events. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, let's see. Then Tom was like, is the username. And he's wondering if he can set multiplayer so that he can only play as allied. Cause he really doesn't want to play as a Nazi. Is that possible just to lock in purely allied? You know, that's again, coming back to some of the creative things that we wrestled with the call of duty multiplayer is about factions, right? And it's always been about two teams or at least two allied forces in the factions of those two. So you'll never play as a Nazi. You will play as a German or other members of the allied or Axis forces. So it's a it's an ensemble cast of Allied and Axis. Um, you know, there's uh, Dutch soldiers and there's British soldiers and there's American soldiers and Canadian soldiers. There's plenty of people on the Allied side. There's an ensemble cast on the Axis side. Um, but yes, you will spend 
half your matches being uh, the Axis side. That's interesting. So how do you say that? Like you'll be playing as a German, but not a Nazi, just because multiplayer is kind of stripped of that historical aspect? Well, you know, a lot of the, the Nazi soldiers weren't on the front lines of the battle anyways. When you think about what really happened in the war, um, you know, the SS and the Nazi forces were, um, the Gestapo were doing other things than sitting out there defending Normandy Beach. In fact, Normandy Beach was largely not even made up of Germans. It was made up of conscripted soldiers from other places that the, um, the Axis forces had captured. And so it does reflect what really happened, which is oftentimes the frontline fights were um, of ensemble cast of Axis forces, but um, they weren't Nazis, they weren't SS. And, and so that is the route we went. Um, which I think captures what really happened on the front lines of the battle. Well, and, and, and Michael brings it up because it was an important part of our research, was that, you know, uh, many people distinguish between, yes, I was a German, but I was not a Nazi. And that, you know, even today, that, you know, sort of thing, I guess, exists in, in, in the history of it. So uh, it was important that we actually made that distinction within the game. Gotcha. Uh, Usman Shasada is wondering, uh, what are the plans for rolling out the beta? What does the future of the beta look like? Is it always going to be private? You know, the beta has been fantastic for us. So we're now in weekend two. Um, we've got some more surprises coming. We've, you know, increased level caps, added more th maps, more modes. So we're gathering a ton of feedback, which has been fantastic for the studio. Good. You know, we've mentioned this before in other places, but, you know, imagine you spent two and a half years with several hundred developers and then in one day, you get to scale to millions of players at once and really watch what happens with balance, with your backend server infrastructure. We're learning a ton. So we're gonna get through the beta this weekend too, which takes us to Monday, Labor Day. Um, a few more surprises on that. So uh, hopefully fans will continue to, to engage and send us feedback on Reddit. Um, and then we'll figure out what our next steps are um, on the road to November. It's been really constructive, good feedback yeah. too. And in, in a really, positive way i mean uh it's really been refreshing twitter and all that stuff coming up it's it's been feeling like people want to help instead of like your shotgun sucks it's more like hey here are the <laughs> here are the couple things that we think you should do a couple of thoughts um yeah i know some people really hate you so you, you're gonna get some of that but <laughs> no, it doesn't be quite as bad it, it is true yeah. glenn makes a good point i mean one of the reasons for the beta is to stress the back end right to really see can the game go live in November and hold its ground. And we've seen amazing stuff, right? We've seen um, incredibly stable software. We've seen great matchmaking. We've seen great um, dedicated um, server supports up and running across the globe. So all that's been great on the back end side. But really, to Glenn's point, on the, on the community engagement, the feedback fans, I mean, look, we've got a great, passionate, engaged community. Um, they don't always agree with some of the decisions. They, all, they don't always agree with each other. Uh, yeah, that's true. But, you know, through Reddit and the beta survey and all these uh, Twitter, um, we love it. And so we can't thank the community enough. It's kind of fascinating. So studying Reddit, I'm sure you have plenty of analytics you're running as well and Twitter. And then you just have like a whiteboard full of all the suggestions. And it's like, all right, how much can we steer this ship? Like which ones? Maybe we can like change a few spawn points, but we can't, you know, redesign all the maps or some feedback just has to be like impossible with this timetable. So how do you determine what is possible and what isn't as far as changing the course? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We we have what we call our war room. It's a little bit like, uh, I mean, this is a bridge too far, but it's a little like the launch site for NASA, right? It's a room <laughs> dedicated to collecting all the feedback. There's monitors and giant TVs plastering every wall where we're constantly watching all of the infrastructure performance, all the analytics stuff you're talking about, um, you know, internal feedback from our customer service group, as well as Twitter and Reddit and all these places. Um, and you look for patterns. Um, you look for, you know, the critical things that bubble up. Um, there is. We're looking at heat maps. Yeah. Heat maps, um, paths that people go, where people are dying. And it's both in single player, multiplayer, and in zombies, just across the board. Yeah all types of user testing coming in. It's really great. And, you know, it is data driven, right? And that's the that's the great thing about being at scale now. I mean, you can look across, you know, millions of hours of playtime now and say, what is the best gun? What's yeah. the what's the lowest KD gun? How are our, our good and bad spawn rates? And they're really phenomenally good right now. Um, how's the how, are, you know, web maps people are upvoting and, and responding to. But you're right. Like there are times where um, 
you you almost want to leave a rough edge in and see if the community is having an initial reaction to it or if it's actually an issue, right? Like we, today we were talking this morning about the M1A1, the tuning on the M1A1, right? And watching its usage. And um, so it, we kind of bucket like, oh man, hey, here's here's some consistent feedback that we agree with and, and it validates what we want to do. And here's some things we want to test. For example, um, live right now, uh, Team Deathmatch is set to a 100 point score limit, right? That was a direct ask from the community coming out of weekend one, where previously it was set at 75. Now we're watching the matches and we're watching community respond to that. And um, they want 75. Yeah, they want us to move it back. And so it gives us a really, you know, the great thing about the beta is you can almost A, B test things. Hey, right. you said you wanted this. We had it here. Let's try both and then we'll gather the feedback. So um, part of it is identifying trends that are popping out and, and that validate some of our concerns. Some of it is actually doing live testing, and that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah right on. Uh, Turbo Eimer is wondering, with Nazi Zombies, um, is he going to be able to play it casually? How hard, how hardcore will this game be? Because he likes playing it with friends, but he's worried about just getting crushed again and again and again. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really good question, too. And it's something that we thought about right from the very start, is that um, we know that there's a really great hardcore game there. And, and so we made sure that we had a team just focused on the hardcore but one of the big focus um, for the game was to try and make it uh, as accessible to the first time player as possible. We wanted people to play, you know, we've got all the, all the analytics on all the other uh, zombie games. So we know how long people play and how far. And we wanted to double and triple that amount that the first time player will get in and play. We want them to see the game. And, uh, and so I think that, uh, it feels like that we've accomplished uh, the, the goal because people are really getting in and playing a long time, and yet we got some really deep, hardcore stuff still in there. Okay, right on. So, uh, they easily easily jump in there and, and get a real feel for the game. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned in one of the video interviews, I thought, I thought was interesting, just how, uh, how much pride you have that Sledgehammer Games was able to tackle all three modes. Uh, and I'm wondering what that balance is like. Is there ever discussion of like, hey, we have Raven in the wings or another studio that can help out if we need it. We just need to pull that ripcord when the time comes. Was that ever on the table or how do you balance how much Sledgehammer can handle? Well, Raven's, Raven has been helping us. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're uh, but we are the, we are the, we've designed the game. We've uh, laid it out. We've been working on it for three years. We got some help from Raven who will come in um, from time to time. And um, they're just a good partner of ours. They've worked with us for the last couple of games. Uh, but make no doubt, it's a sledgehammer game um, with, with just some help from some really, really good uh, developers that we have a lot of respect for. Right on. Uh, shifting to the campaign a little bit. A lot of people are very eager to play this thing. There's probably the most questions about the campaign uh, Sweaty Rob, super cool name. He's wondering, uh, Call of Duty Big Red Ones campaign focused on the same division as uh, your upcoming game. And so what steps did you guys take to ensure that your characters and story beats were different from Call of Duty Big Red Ones? Yeah, that's a common question. You know, the 1st Infantry, 15,000 troops, right? Big division. Um, our story follows a squad within those 15,000, right? So it's, a, it's an original story. One can elaborate on that, but um, has no ties to this giant first infantry that was part of previous games. So, within our ensemble cast of allied, um, it is an original story. Yeah, we wanted to, the um, the the first is really sort of the vehicle that gets us um, having a platoon that. Uh, stayed together for over a year. We wanted to, as Michael said, we want to tell the story within the story. And it's the story of what, what these guys were on. What, what is it like to be on the front lines of the European theater in World War II? And what did these guys talk about? What did they dream about and think about? Um, and so we needed a, a group to get, get that went through a long period of, uh, of battle, and it was a big red one. But it's following um, these guys in, in, in the squad. That's the important part. Gotcha. And you know, what we really wanted to do is capture the fact that this was a multinational allied force, right? This was a global conflict. And I think we've talked to you about this before, but with our military historian, just seeing the scale of this, right? You know, between the conflict itself and all of the atrocities that surrounded it and the famine, you know, 100 million people died, you know, due to this conflict. 100 million over six years, right? Um, nearly every nation on the planet was involved. And so 
we do follow a, a, a squad within the first infantry, but you will play with um, an allied ensemble cast like the British uh, Royal Air Force. You'll play with the French Resistance. We talked about this before. You'll play as a as a strong female lead. Um, so, so it won't be just um, following in the footsteps of the first. Um, you'll get to see it through the perspective of, of an ensemble allied cast. Oh, great. Yeah, Touchdown uh, Juggernaut is wondering that exact thing is, uh, in regards to vehicles in the campaign. It's always been his favorite part of the Call of Duty series, and he's wondering how you guys are going to handle it if the protagonist is part of the infantry squad. So some of those other people, are they more vehicle prone? Yeah, I mean, you know, the... Uh, I don't know, Migs, you stop me if I'm going too much, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we do... We, we're in a bunch of different vehicles, and, of course, you have sort of some American vehicles that we're, we're in. Um, and uh, But you do get inside the tank, and... Um, uh, we spent a lot of time on that, man. I can't wait. Uh, and, um, you know, of course, you, you're just not going to get inside a tank. So we have a, a really cool transition from one character to another um, that gets you into into the uh, the tank. It makes makes a lot of sense with the stories. Okay. And, you know, the, the German and Allied, you know, mechanized forces were really powerful during this time, right? So between Jeeps and tanks and trains and um, aircraft, there's there's a lot of vehicle opportunities in World War II that uh, that we think we've captured in a pretty special way in the campaign. Yeah, yeah. I know you guys are trying to tell a more intimate story here uh, with Red and Alpha Black is wondering if there's going to be a focus on large battles throughout the campaign as well. Has that been a push for the team? Is this to show the scale of this war? Yeah, I mean, I don't think Sledgehammer has ever been known for being um, shy about the big moments. We blew up the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, basically blew up uh, Manhattan and Mon Warfare 3. <laughs> um, and so um, we we blow stuff up. Okay. Yeah, no, look, it's a really important to us. This was a giant, epic battle. And one of the things that we talked about in the very beginning was like, we would love to see Sledgehammer's take on World War II because we like the sweeping scenes. We like the big open battles. You know, we like the tank shots. And so, yeah, that's in there. You have an intimate story. But the reason why we chose the first as well is because they went through some of the biggest battles in the history of mankind. And um, we make sure that we, uh, we give that justice as well, right? Yeah, we certainly do. And I think it's important because... You know, we chose Normandy, the invasion on D-Day, because it's such an iconic part of the Allied force pushing back the German war machine. That was a massive battle, right? So, of course, you got to capture it at that scale. And there are others that Glenn was referencing. Yeah. But we also, to balance that and make it impactful and make you care about the squad and the cause, you have to have those intimate moments as well, right? So those low yeah. moments, those moments that touch on the atrocities, the moments that touch on the humanity. I mean, war brings out the best and the worst in people, and you'll see that from both perspectives. So, mm -hmm. yes, we go to 11, and then, you know, we'll take you to these intimate places, too, to really make it powerful and, and uh, hopefully, you know, tug on your heartstrings a bit. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, MJSH is just wondering when we're going to see more of the campaign. Are you guys planning on revealing more, maybe at Tokyo Game Show or at some point coming up soon? Yeah, we, uh, we're excited to share. We haven't announced yet anything official on the campaign, but you know, there's a lot of time between now and November, so you know, stay tuned to at SH Games and and the COD channels because we, we we'd love to share as much as we can. We're looking forward to it too. <laughs> so, yeah, we just we're just kind of waiting for when uh, we get the signal. Yeah, um, and then uh, we'll show more stuff. Can't wait. And he's also wondering uh, if you guys can compare the length of the campaign to Advanced Warfare's. Is it around the same? Have you guys done that time test? We have. We have. Yeah, it's um. It's a good, solid campaign. It's um, yeah, we're not going to give hours, but it's yeah. yeah, around. I would say it's a good, good length. We're pretty excited about yeah. that too. Okay. Roughly in, in range of, of advanced warfare. Yeah, right on. Uh, hey, speaking of advanced warfare, I mean, you talk about Big Red One and it being a separate story and whatnot. Is there a universe where this game exists in the same universe as Advanced Warfare? Do you guys have any Easter eggs to those games existing technically within the same world, just in the past version of it? <sighs> Well, you know, we do like to give uh, fans um, things to find and discover, Easter eggs, if you will. Um, so there might be a few things in there that um, that you'll see. I mean, we're proud of Advanced Warfare, and we didn't go out to, you know, um, intentionally build a world that had both Advanced Warfare storyline in the World War II setting storyline. But, yeah, fans will find some some little nods to our 
our pedigree, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, I think as soon as we start nodding too much of the story towards a game that we made up the story, then we get out of the reality of the World War II thing, too. Yeah, there's ways to subtly do it, for sure. Uh, Julian Magni loves the music in the beta, and there's wondering if you guys are ready to talk about the composer yet. Uh, I don't think we've made an announcement on the composer, but uh, I can say that we've been working with uh, him or her <laughs> for the last couple of years. And... Um, Wow, that's really specific. And they make music. No, 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 no. It's and we've been down. We, we recorded in front of a symphony. It is. It's awesome. I'm telling you, we we spent a lot of time trying to get sort of a, a good theme song for it. And um, man, I could go on and just give away a lot of secrets, but I won't. All right. Inside. Sounds good. Simple technical question from Justin P. Uh, will the game have two or four player split screen for competitive multiplayer and zombie? Yes, three. Three. Interesting choice. Uh, have you guys locked that down if it's going to be two or four? Yes. <laughs> um, we're still doing a, a bunch of stuff on performance and optimization. I mean, the beta ran. It's really solid, and you've seen some of the, I think, technical reviews of that performance. Um, we will be supporting split screen in multiplayer and zombies, but we haven't announced yet um, anything gotcha. beyond that. How difficult is that to get that up and running on modern oh my consoles? Goodness. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a really great experience. TVs now, I mean, you, you know, like, you have this giant 60-inch TV in your living room, and it's great to have your buddy there or your friend or your your um, brother or sister, whoever, uh, playing couch. Your cellmate. Um, <laughs> or your cellmate, apparently. Uh, but imagine, you know, holding up the fidelity of the game, you know, 60 frames a second with, you know, 1080p resolution and perhaps running HDR on, on these platforms and then drawing each of those pixels twice. Um, it takes a lot of hardware to get it right. And for us, you know, Call of Duty has always been about maintaining 60, 60 frames a second. That's that low latency MP experience that people um, demand and that we believe in. So, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get it right. Yeah, but there's a lot of people cranking away at it within Sledgehammer. That is true, too. Awesome. Cool. Well, that's it for community questions. Anything else you guys want to say? Anything to wrap up this month of coverage here? Those are good questions. I appreciate that. I can. Uh, we always like ones that are a little bit insightful, trying to find out stuff on how we made the game. So uh, that, was, that was nice to hear. So My thanks. only question is, how come there's nothing on that bookshelf behind you that has COD and World War II on it? That's Ooh. a good question. Seriously, what, yeah. like, what, what, what's going on? We do need well, something. We need to shake up the set in some way. I don't know if you guys... I, I have like a sledgehammer coin. I think I could put that up there maybe. Something along those lines. We'll make it work. Right, we'll get you something. We're, yeah. we're gonna, we're, we'll see we're it on the next it. one. Yeah, we'll put a helmet on Lara Croft back there or something it's for you guys. Andre's 3D printed head. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, guys. And thanks for letting us invade Thank the you, studio man. for a couple of days and crank out a month of coverage. It's been a fun one. Uh, yeah, guys. It really has thanks been. Thanks a lot. And, and on behalf of the whole studio, thanks for all the support over the beta. Yes. You guys at Game Informer and fans, because this, this week's been incredibly exciting for us between the beta and Gamescom and the road ahead. So thank you on behalf of everybody here. Right on. Thanks so much. Number third. And thank you so much for watching this special edition of the Game Informer Show. If you enjoyed it, uh, feel free to tell a friend uh, recommend it to a Call of Duty fan in your life. Uh, we really appreciate the support. And thank you for following our Call of Duty World War II coverage throughout the month. And look forward to a podcast in the future where we talk about our review for the game. Bye, everybody.